Welcome to Citizens Insight, the Citizens Party's interview series on matters of national and international importance. Today, the Aussie battler versus the giant bank. What does it take to get financial justice in Australia? I want to welcome two special guests to today's interview, Wayne Ditchburn and Rowena Hardy, who are a couple from New South Wales who have had an extraordinary experience with the banks. Welcome, guys. Thank you. Uh, welcome. Thank you, Robbie. The reason I've asked Wayne to come on this show is because the Citizens Party has been campaigning for a long time to clean out the corruption in the financial system. And we had an extraordinary political event two and a half years ago in Australia in the Banking Royal Commission, where a lot of the bank's crimes were laid bare. Now, there'd been a long lead up to that Royal Commission. We're involved in it. We knew how bad the banking system was. was. We knew how bad the abuses were. Um, only certain parts of the media paid attention to that. Um, towards the end, there was a lot more attention though when we finally got a Royal Commission. 10,000 banking victims made submissions to that Royal Commission. I think perhaps 50 might have got to take the stand or, or even less. It was actually a, a tiny percentage got to actually be heard at that Royal Commission. But two and a half years later, the Royal Commission may as well not have happened. You have a, a corporate regulator in ASIC that, has, that is so weak it's laughable and the federal government has just made it far weaker. And that means that the, its role as a cop on the beat, the so-called tough cop on the beat it once, it once laughingly referred to itself as, um, uh, is completely ineffective. And the financial predators out there know that there is nothing to fear in financial regulation in Australia. And that has consequences. And it has consequences for, for thousands and thousands and thousands of Australians who are victims of the banks. There's, um, I would argue, millions of Australians are victims of the banks because the banks have defined the financial system we all exist in and it's terrible. Hundreds of thousands of Australians are victims of the banks directly through things like basic stuff like overcharging. And then you get tens of thousands of Australians that are victims of real abuse and injustice. Um, and of those victims, only a, a, a hardy few are able to battle the banks to some kind of resolution. And two of those hardy few are Wayne Ditchburn and Rowena Hardy, um, which is why I've invited them on the show and we've called it this. And I have, I have huge admiration for you guys and I want, the, I want the Australian public to hear your story and I want politicians to hear your story so that they can be reminded of the face of banking abuse in Australia, why we cannot tolerate what the government's now doing to, to weaken the already weak uh, regulator in ASIC. So welcome again, guys. Um, Thanks, Bobby. Let's, let's get into your story. Wayne, why did you contact me when you saw the Citizens Party's first reports on the Sterling First scandal in Western Australia? Well, the reason I contacted you, Robert, is because my mother and father were ripped off later in, late in their life by a company called Australian Capital Reserve, which was prosecuted by ASIC, found to be a crime. Um, no accountability, no one goes to jail, and none of these people get their money back, my mother and father. Basically, Price Waters Cooper gets involved. All these all these people get involved, um, but nobody, the victim, doesn't seem to get anything out of it. They don't get, and there's no uh, accountability. It seems the other parties that I was ripped off in in my lifetime, and now so that shows me there's two generations now from the same family. Yeah, both of us been ripped off. Now, had I have not gone to the bank and just stuck with my mum and dad and we carried on like normal, we wouldn't have been in this trouble and I still would have had my original home um, and they would have had their money. Um, however, I went to the bank to get a small part of money to pay my mother and father back the bit that I owed them left so that they had a bit of quality of life left that they could get, you know, help in the home and things like that when they get up because my dad was suffering. He was an invalid. And, um, of course, uh, that snowballed into this fiasco where, you know, I battle for 14 years later, you know, at the end of the day, um, and I go through this massive rigmarole to find out how this system's structured. And now that I've kind of got it in my head and I've worked it out, I know what happened to my mother and father. Yeah. I know what happened to us. 
And that's why, and then I see the Sterling first victims come out on the television and we've just had a banking Royal Commission that was $75 million. I got the books here. I've read them, I've studied them, I've done everything. And it just seemed to be a fiasco that went by, blinked an eye, all the handful of people got looked at. People like me and my mother and father, no, none of us got to look in. And all of a sudden it's all said and done. And now we've got Josh Frydenberg, Scott Morrison, these are the people that were staving off this Bank and Royal Commission 26 times saying nothing to see here and where there was plenty to see, but yeah. unfortunately the Australian population didn't see it all. And that's why I was, in the end, I couldn't stand it any longer. It, this has ruined my life. It ruined my children. It destroyed us all. Hurt my mother and father. And I thought, you know what? I've had a guffle and I need to come out. And you guys are the only guys that seem to know what is happening. And so that's why I've been to many ministers, many members of parliament, um, ASIC, FOS, AFCA, and, um, every cor corporate body, every body that's been there for consumer protection to no avail. They, they all basically can't do anything or don't do anything. So, but Wayne, based on your experience, and again, before we get into the details of your case, but you, you and your legal advisors have come up with actually quite a good idea that can give... Um, uh, bank victims a chance in Australia. Just, just, just um, sketch out quickly what you would like to achieve. Well, after what I've experienced, what I'd like to see, it shouldn't go for this long for a start. I mean, the trauma that you get put through is incredible. And so to, to nip it in the bud early, I feel that if we had a, uh, a, a team of, say, retired judges or solicitors or upstanding people, have an independent system where a person like me can take my documents in and just have these people assess them. And if there's merit, then that can be filed, tick the boxes off and then sent to a, a, a big firm in Sydney, the class action lawyers and those people that have got the funds to be able to take on a case for a victim like me and actually go to court and see it through yeah. and, 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 and get it quickly fixed up. Or if it's a smaller problem, it doesn't need to go to court, have it rectified so both parties can get on their feet straight away and, and get back to their reality. Um, this takes you down a nightmare that ends up staying with you. You can't get rid of it. No matter how many doctors you go and see, it's something you live. Yeah. So I'm getting a little bit off track and I get a little bit lost. But at the end of the day, we need a system in place that's quite simple. I call it KISS. Keep it simple, stupid. You go in, you see these group of people, they sign off it and say, yes, no, no, yes, whatever. But then the big guys can tackle it. Take it. They've got the funding to go through court to take yeah. to see exactly all the finer details and make, make a decision. And if that decision is not for the bank and it's for the victim, then the compensation must be worked out by compensation lawyers or something like that to see what the damage of the person's life is and then correctly pay them so that they're not sitting dependent on the taxpayer of Australia on a disability pension for the mine damage that the banks have caused, that the victims take this and go away kind of thing, and then you've got to try and work out the rest of your life, yeah. and, you're, and you're dependent on handouts by the taxpayer of Australia. Now, that seems to be wrong to me because the taxpayer of Australia wasn't the person that did this. And so the person responsible should be the person who pays the compensation, and that's got to be an, an adequate compensation for the damage for the rest of that person's life. All right, well, I agree completely. Let's now talk about your 14-year your not year nightmare that brought you to this conclusion that that's what's necessary, because I think it, the, the story speaks for itself. So tell us about your background, what your life plans were before you decided to borrow from a bank in 2004. Um, well, I'd left school at 15 and I'd worked in the bakeries and I went out of the bakeries and I'd done a few other jobs. I ended up concreting quite a while. And then uh, I was ended up being a single parent and um, my son come to live with me. So I was a single parent there for quite a while, raising my son, and uh, I started a a sign writing and screen printing business in Ulladulla with a partner. And um, we started that business off um, and it was quite low at first. It was only a small little business and we started, well, it grew. 
and it grew quite good. And uh, eventually the partner I started with, he decided he didn't want to continue with it and he moved out and I took it over. And I pursued on with my parents uh, and carried on there. And um, my son was coming out of school and then he wanted to do his trade. So I put him through the trade under the business and he became a screen printer and sign writer and graphic designs and things. And um, we bought the premises, which is a commercial premises. Now, this is where my mother and father helped me to buy the, borrow the money to buy this premise, and I do. And so I'm a commercial. We're going along pretty good. And the idea is that, uh, you know, at the end of the day, I'm not going to be doing this forever, and Jay's done his trade. And so we're hoping that this family business could eventually be the next child could go through this business and the next child, of course, and so on. And it'd be a family business that was basically there forever. Um, and so, of course, borrowing the money off the bank to, to make these changes, my son was about to take over that business and we were going to buy a little hobby farm, which is what we were anticipating doing. And in the background of that hobby farm, I still could have nurtured the business with Jay and just helped him through it in case there was any glitches. But he was pretty on top of it and he's a good worker. So we were pretty confident there. When it all fell apart, when I got down here with the bank, I got my new home here. We'd already set up this establishment so that, and it was talked to the about to the broker, this is the plans. We had a big plan, what we were doing in our life. And Jay was taking over and I was dropping off the, the business a bit. And, uh, you know, the other kids could possibly come through the door later on down the track. This starts a, a spiral of when I hit the bank that ruins my mother and father, upsets my son's career. Yeah. and crushes us and it just it's too hard to actually put into words in a small amount of time Robbie what you go through but everything everything you think that's going to happen doesn't yeah something it's there's a hurdle thrown up at every given point you can imagine and then you knock those hurdles down and you expect well that's a hurdle I got over it I'll get over another one I'll keep going and you keep going you fight on but at the end of the day, it destroys us, my parents, my extended family, yep. my son, my, my friends. Um, you know, it's, it's something you just cannot explain. It, it lives with you and it destroys your, your ability, your trust. I don't have any faith in the, in the, anything. In the government. I don't have any faith in the law. I don't have any faith in the way... Um, the system is run that if you get into trouble, there's nowhere there to go to, to get you out of trouble. Wayne, let's go through the details of this chronologically. What did you think you were borrowing when you borrowed from the bank? Well, I thought I was borrowing, um, uh, I thought I was borrowing money for my first home, my first principal place of residence, accompanied with a government grant. So oh, I, don't, wow. I mean, a small amount, really, yep. in the scheme of things for a home loan, which is because I had a, a, a bit of my own money and um, not a lot, not a lot of money. So a real easy peasy loan, you would have thought. Um, but what, so did you, what did you discover? Sorry? What did, but what did you discover later that you had borrowed? Or, or, that, or that it had been changed to it more, more to the point? Well, it had been organised that at first it was supposed to be a, a, a loan. I went to the broker, of course, and the, and the, and the broker, we, and he, the broker actually knows us and they knew of our, our business. And I actually, I'm a sign writer, screen printer, and graphic designer. And so we did all the textiles and printing and things. So we did a lot of community work. We actually did work for both the, the, the branch manager at the bank and also the broker in the local town. Um, these were people that knew us. Um, when I went to them, I was in trusted hands. Um, I believe these people were in looking after my best interest, mm. which they were. And those two were? They were. And um, they set uh, a loan up. We went in, we filled out you know, approximately 12-page document and uh, it went to head office. Everything went through and you're quite excited. You're buying a, your first home, you you're keen and you're eager and all those sort of things and it's all exciting. And um, you um, find out later that they've set you up into a facility that's supposed to have a redraw on it. And then when you go to redraw, they restructure the whole loan 
And that's when I questioned it. I said, well, it can't be. You can't do this because I said it's a redraw on the facility we set up with the original broker. And we, we discussed all this. And um, it was only a small redraw. It was $30,000 to do the renovations and pour some, a concrete slab for the little shed that we needed and some renovations on the, on the new place that we bought. So still a relatively low loan. Yeah. Um, that's where they turned it into a different loan. And then when I questioned them then, they said, oh, that's how we had to do it. And I said, well, that's not kind of what I wanted. That, you know, this is how we were supposed to run. And this is, and at the end of the day, it was, look, this is how we've had to do it because of your property size. And I asked them about that. And I said, well, what's the difference between my property size? And they said it was over 100 acres. So they had to change it into this other facility. And I said, well, why didn't you just tell me then I would have, you know, tried to go somewhere else or something if, you, if I'd have known that. And that's where they kind of trick you and say at the end of the day, if you don't like it, you know, seek legal advice. Well, I've done that and then I realised that that's just an impossible. So to be clear, to, to be clear, they changed, they changed the terms of the loan without you knowing and then they told you when you complained and questioned it, um, seek legal advice. Yeah, pretty much what happens is um, you ring up after you've moved to your new premises and they and it was supposed to be about three or four months and then they said, and I had money, I said, I'll keep some of this money. At originally, the broker, I said, I'll keep some of the money because when we get there, we'll need to do some renovations and fix up the place. And they said, oh, no, don't worry about that. You've got a redraw facility. <laughs> and I said, oh, well, what, what do you mean? They said, oh, no, look, that's okay. Just once you get there and you work out what you need, you can come back and you just, and it's simple. And I went, oh, wow, that's great, you know. So I thought, oh, beauty, we're, we're looking good here. When I rang the redraw to say, yes, I'm ready, oh, this is what we needed. I don't need a lot of money, I just need about 30 back to, to do the renos or whatever. And they said, yeah, next thing, these pages turn up. And I've been told over the phone, just sign the document, send it back. And, you know, and I, I thought oh, I was a redraw. I thought I wondered about it. And I thought, oh, well, they know what they're doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They sent me the documents in the mail with some stickers here, sign here. And I just sent them, just put them, put them sent them back. And then later, a little bit later down the track, when the documents come through, I, I, I look at them and I just noticed that the interest rate's a lot higher. Things aren't. And I looked at how much I was paying and I started to do that. Now, I'm green here. I'm, I'm pretty green, you know, like, yeah. and, oh, that doesn't look right. Jeez, I'm, how am I paying that much money? And so then I look over here and I look at the loan, the loan number and I look at the new, and it's a different loan number. Right. And that's when I said, well, that can't be right because it's a completely different loan. So I rang them. I said, I think something's gone wrong. And they said, what do you mean? And I said, on the redraw facility, it's supposed to be a redraw and I'm a first home buyer with a first home buyer's loan grant style. And I said, and this is a lot in higher interest that I'm in now. And I said, and it looks like it's been a completely different change. And I said, um, what happened to the original loan number? And they said, balked a bit at that and um, came back to me a few times over the phone. But in the end, the, the story was, look, Wayne, that's how we had to do it because of the size of your property. And I said, well, that's not kind of right because I'd already been to years and we've already got this done with the broker. Now, when the broker and the banker, original banker, gets involved in this, Robbie, they tell him to drop it, both of them. Now, these are, these are people I've known. So hang on, the, ba the, 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 bank, hey, the bank head office told the two your two local contacts in my email to yeah, drop in it. My, my email records will show all this Robbie yeah. how many times we tried to contact the bank how many how much Every help, day. how much help I had in contacting the bank who helped me to contact the bank all the um, you know the financial uh, counseling people so your local contacts your local contacts did the right thing by you but the, them, but the head them office them. told them to back off Head office did, yeah. yeah. Um, describe what the difference was like in terms of uh, affordability. What, what, what were you loaded with then and what, what did you have to do to be able to try and meet those payments? I had to change my whole life structure. Everything. And I had to stop my son from taking over what he was supposed to do and I had to borrow from my mother and father again, which... And friends and family. Um, and I had to find extra work. Or I had to start things up that I was retiring from. I was, I was handing over to Jay 
and we were hobby farming. Then I had to regroup and come back and say, look, sorry, Jay, can't have the business now. Got to do this. I need to pay this money to the bank. Um, he now he now has to travel three hours up and down the coast to come to my place to try. My son honestly stuck by me all the way and he's possibly the reason why he has something today is because he's like me, he's a goer. But he, that kid just, he drove for hours and hours and hours every day back and forth and stayed at our place for weeks on end, working and printing and pushing out as much work as we possibly could, taking on stuff that we didn't really want to do. And not in a factory scenario. Work, this is in a house. In this the is in our house. Room. This is in our back of our house. We've had to set this up. We haven't got anywhere at the moment. We've got a place that I'd set up for Jay to do all this, take over, but he's not there because we, yeah. we can't do it there. And so we've it's, it's ruined everything. It's changed everything. I even get to the stage where I have to take jobs at the school, our local school here, which is great. They were helpful. Uh, all these people in our local area that knew what was going on did their best to help us. I look, you know, you could, I worked at the winery to get some cash to keep the money flowing, but all this money just goes to the bank. It doesn't go to our kids or to our school uh, excursions and things yeah. that we're supposed to be doing. It's just the drain to get as much money as we can to fist into this bank to keep our home that we shouldn't be doing. We shouldn't be doing any of this. I was doing three jobs a day. Six days a week, and then also and working not, on the Sunday. Not well paid jobs hideous. either, Robbie. These are these are you know twenty dollar an hour jobs, or yeah, it wasn't <laughs> proper wages. Not a lot of money, um, and it's a struggle. And Wayne, when um, and Wayne, I just just to get a little bit more personal, and apologies apologies for this, but um, I don't want it to be glossed over. You found yourself in this mess, and I imagine there's all kinds of emotions about um, what you're what you've put your family through, what you're putting your son through, your parents, etc., cetera, um, and feeling like a bit of a dill, I'm sure, as well. Like, how did it come to this? How difficult was that? <laughs> Can I say things? No one believed us. No one believed Wayne. At first, I was so hard. It was really hard for me to understand because I was brought up as in, you know, treat others how you want to be treated. Yeah. And I was questioning Wayne all the time, saying, why would the why would people do this to us? Like it just didn't make sense at all. My partner's very honest, naive in a in a sense, and wouldn't wouldn't think <laughs> that these people would do these kind of things. As I started get, sinking into it to re, the realization Robbie wasn't good. Um yeah. Wayne was like a cage. It brought me cat. down. He was so there was frustrated a, because no one would listen. No one would listen to what he was I saying. I was up here with anger. And I was yeah, down here with on, depression. Full on. Um, yeah. And then back up here with anger and back down here with depression. And I guess I got to a stage there where, um, yeah, you know, I, I'm not a person that ever thought about suicide or anything like that. Um, always been a happy guy, surfing, snowboarding, activities. Um, it brought me down, brought me to a place I never ever thought I'd be, I'd get to, and I never thought I'd witness. Yeah, no, I um, and um, but I kept uh, getting offers to go and see counsellors and doctors and all, which I did. Um, and to what I got a doctor who said to me one thing, um, who had diagnosed people with depression that had boats and houses and wealth and everything, family, and they were simply depressed and wanted to neck himself and they had no reason why. And they said to me, yours is very difficult to medicate because we know you do have a problem. You have a reason. Rid of it and you can't get it out of your head. Yeah. And so to give me pills to, to subdue me. Which he did once and was a totally different person. Was actually person. doing a worse thing for me because it was making me dopey and sleepy that I was and the bank would have just rolled me well, one, so, so, sorry no. so that medication system going down that road is also help, helpful but it can also hinder mm, sure but, but Wayne one thing you did do that I've been struck by is um, with all this going on you didn't give up on trying to solve the problem so no. 
Just describe those interactions with the bank all those f for those first few years after this, um, how often you'd be talking to them and trying to get them to address this. Oh, every day, Robbie. And it Week was, every day. Weekly. Um, you know, look, I've got the emails. I've got all the correspondence. It starts in 2005 and doesn't stop, Robbie, every week. It doesn't stop. Still going now. Um, yeah. We're in 2021 and, and we're, still, we're still here. The reason it doesn't stop is because you know you've been rolled. You know all these people did this. You know there was nowhere to go to. You know there's no accountability for any of it. Yeah. They're all still getting paid there. These jobs. guys all have They're careers. Still. They still got their jobs. Some of them re revolved around into different positions and whatnot, which we'll go over later. However, they've all still got careers and they can all still. And I loved what I did. I loved creating and I loved um, building up a business that my son was going to take over. I was proud. Um, they turned that. Everything that I'd ever worked for it was almost like pull the carpet out from under me and let everything hit the deck and I had to put it all back together as best I can with broken plates and everything and then try and show all these broken bits to people like consumer departments to say, look, what happened to us is there any way you can help us? Not one of them were no. interested. Yeah. But in yeah. even our member of parliament that we went to, Anne Sadmalas, who was a beautiful lady who did her best, honestly, um, but she was in a party that was voting 26 times down against the Royal Commission. Yeah. And I'd already taken my documents to a, a solicitor in Sydney and I had my parents help me. <laughs> my parents helped me all the time. And I borrowed off my mate, who was a, my mate Mark, who I must mention, was my advocate, who was a friend and knows me, knows what I started, knows all my career, knows me as a person. And he helped me keep my feet on the ground. Uh, he was the guy who, who knew what I was going through. and Understood it. Yeah, understood. And he had the correct helpful points to get me the right information, like the freedom of information documents and to push further into not tackling the ankles of these people, actually going for the throat a bit more. Well, let's... Um, let's go back to the chronology, though, because I, I, uh, I should reference, it. there's an article on our website for, for people who want to read on a similar title, The Aussie Battler Takes on the a Giant Bank, um, where I've, I've, I've written an article about Wayne's story, and I've written it in chronological order, and I want, I want people to understand, because there's a series of things that happen that are quite extraordinary, actually. It's, it's a fascinating story in its own right. Um, uh, because the way it unfolded is what allowed you to get some, some um, resolution later. And that's important for people to get some sense of that. So just back to the chronology now, tell us about the evictions. And I, well, um, what year were they? But what, I think there was two attempts to evict you. Just describe the, that, that part of the process. Okay. So 2012 was the first. So, well, basically, what happened, Robbie, was they weren't they weren't interested in putting it back to a normal situation or helping me in any of that form. All they were trying to do was it was just snowball effect. It was just um, a band aid effect all the time, throwing different options out at me, but none to help, none that actually helped us. Um, and at the end of the day, they. I went through a lot of portfolio people. Yeah. And each time I'd wear, exhaust them and they'd, you know, and I'd get a new one and a new one would start with hardball until I'd wear them down. They'd go and have a look at the documents and then they'd think, oh, God, this guy maybe is telling the truth. And I could hear it in their voices until I got to the one lady who was real helpful. And I said, and they were ringing me to tell me that it's all said and done, Wayne. There's nothing more we can do. Sheriff's coming, and I'm trying to explain. Like I shouldn't even be in this situation that I'm in. I should be owning my own home and all these sort of things. And before you do take it, would you please go and have one more look just to see? And if I've done the wrong thing or the loans, you know, whatever. But I said, you sound like you're pretty good. If you wouldn't mind having a look. Well, this lady went and had a look. I don't know if she had a look or what she done, but she got off the phone that day. 
And then on the Friday where the sheriff was going to come, we got a phone call saying, this lady from the bank saying, we've stopped, I'm going to stop the sheriff at this stage, Wayne, and I, we were just, I broke down. And he, ourselves. and he couldn't work out what was going on. And I told her, I said, they're not coming, love, this bank. sheriff's not coming, she stopped the bank, he must have had a look and everything's looking good. So I was going to get contacted on the Monday by her. This woman, you know, she tried it on the phone. To, she said, all we can do is offer you a 17 year business loan. And I was like, well, wow, you can do that. You can't what, fix it up and put it back to how it was. Well, you can just out of the blue. And um, I said, look, I'm, that's a great, that's great for trying to help. But I said, that's not going to help. That's going to put me worse off. We still couldn't afford it. We can't afford it. I said, and, the, and I said, and how, how am I going to service it? You know? Um, so she said, okay, I said, well, please, can you work out something else? Why can't we put it back to what it was and help me get my back on my feet? And she said, oh, look, I'll come back to you. And then, of course, on the Monday. Hang on, Wayne. Get... Hang on, Wayne. Before we get to the Monday, I just wanted to, to, to make it clear for people. You're about to be evicted. You, you, you call the bank officer, get, get this bank officer. She goes and looks at your paperwork um, and comes back and has told you that she stopped the sheriff and of course you're immensely relieved. And yeah. now she's gonna call you back on Monday, but before we get to that, did you feel when you were talking to her that she must have found something in your paperwork to reinforce your side of the story? Yes, Robbie, I asked her, I said, oh, I won't say the name, but I said, oh, thanks very much. Did you find something there? And the answer was, well, I don't, let's not go over that, let's look at, how we can do something to fix it. Um, and I said, so you did see something and they were, weren't prepared to go over that information, Robbie. All right. they wanted to do was basically move on to try and m make something else happen. I mean, and she probably would job if she did say something to us at that stage. Sorry, say, just repeat that, Rowena. Uh, just she probably, if she did say to us, you know, oh, I found the problem, she yeah, wouldn't. Yeah, 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 no, no. But by, yeah, great job. You know, no, that's, that's, by her actions, though, the fact that she called off the sheriff and was suddenly helpful or trying to be helpful was seems to indicate that she probably did find something. Um, so what happened on the Monday? Um, well, I was quite excited for it to call to see what, what it was that we were going to be able to try and achieve out of this. Um, I never got a call and I waited and waited and I got to the afternoon where I was getting, it was getting late and I decided I couldn't handle it anymore. So I, I rang the bank um, and I got an answer from the same number that I'd been ringing. Um, it was a different voice. And I asked for this, that person and the person said, oh, this is me speaking. And I said, oh, no, this is someone else. Just because her first name was the same. And this person then said who she was and that the other person who I'd been dealing with on the Friday no longer worked at the bank. And I said to this new person with the same first name, I said, that, I, said I was just speaking on Friday with this person. And, of course, this person said, denied any of that and denied that anyone offered me a 17-year business loan and denied. And I said, well, that's really unfair. I said, you've stopped the sheriff last week and now you're... And so this starts off with this new person who's now the Hard. new, the oh, new oh, portfolio oh, manager. Shit. When we just When I get to the end of the day with this, we find out this is the one who's been in the chair a long time along with a manager that's in the same situation for many, many years. So I realised then that all the people under these have been yep. used, yep. pretty much used. My broker was used, the banker was used, all the people that tried to help me were used. Um, and then when they try to help me, they get cut off. It's like they get cut off, you know? Yeah. Yep. We dealt with so many different people over the one subject. So many people. And, and so after, after this, after that uh, roller coaster, after your, your emotional roller coaster crashed on the Monday because the person who was helping you wasn't there anymore, um, how long did it take before you were eventually evicted? Oh, it still takes a couple more years, Robbie. But what happens is I, I just keep getting asked for more money 
yeah. I keep, I keep, well, I can't pay. I'm, I'm, I'm on the income I need to pay. I need to come at the end of the day is $600 interest only per week. I mean, it'd be good if someone could have a look at how it got to that. Yeah. That's the point I'm trying to make is where if we had a, def, a definite department in place, to, none of this would have took place, Robbie, none of it. So $150 to $600 a week. $120, $5 a week. So, 100, okay, so you signed up, when you signed up to this loan, you thought you were going to be paying $125 a week. Within four or five years, you're now paying $600 interest only. And we're both working our butts off to get this happening. Jay's working hard. Yep. We all ruined the whole, whole family is in a turmoil when we all were situated in a great spot once. We were all looking after each other. We're all independent. We're all together. This just throws us all over the place. We're all struggling. I'm borrowing from, back from a mother and father who I'm supposed to have paid back and they've been ripped off. It's, yeah. it's wild, Robbie. You know, honestly, we had friends dropping food off at the gate because we just were paying bills and no food. No, as a woman, that's my job. You know, it just wasn't sure. going to where it was meant to go. It was going to the bank. Everything. My two daughters, you know, they ended up going to their dad. The Millie kids had Jeff. to leave. We just couldn't. The kids had to go somewhere else to their father's place. Who they were living with us. Kids, no. yeah, no, only babes, it's only little. And then they had to go, we had to organise that they, we couldn't look after them. They were going, we, we were hurting them. Yeah. We were hurting them by not having any money to spend on them. And because we're on a property. Fisting all this money out to the bank, everything we're earning is going to the bank and we're spending tiny little bits on us. Um, no it, near it's not the stuff. way to live considering what we worked for to get, to be able to be in the situation we were first in, to end oh. up in this situation. So, and I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but after you guys were evicted, even um, uh, Wayne, you had to live, cir circumstances forced you to live apart from the family for a while. Yeah, of course. It was a year and a half I lived here with Annie. I, I, and I, I had to go to Dollar. At that stage, Robbie, <laughs> I, was a, I was a terrible person to live yep. with. <laughs> Nobody could live with me. Yep. I was cranky, I was angry, I was furious, I was depressed, I was sad, I was... Every emotion you can imagine, I was living, and that wasn't good for any of the people I was around. So I ended up. I wrote letters to people up high saying, if I, I was too scared to go to Wayne's house in case I found him dead. Well, it wasn't a house. I was in a so, shed. Yeah, a little shed. I was in a shed at the end of a cul-de-sac street, back in the area that I'd founded my business and started where our family lived, and my brother-in-law. Uh, it was good enough to give me this shed at $100 a week, mind you, um, because, I mean, it's it's something that he'd rent $300 a week, you know. But, yeah. of course, he helped me and said, look, there's a shed down there. You can go down there. So down there with no electricity, Robbie, I borrowed the guy or the fella next door at the shed came and met me and said, oh, what are you doing? And I said, oh, well, you know, a bit of trouble. And I give him a bit of a brief and I'm having a hard time with the bank and that. And he said, oh, you haven't got any power at the shed. And I said, no. I said, I got my, I just go up and charge my phone and I use my laptop and my phone. And he said, oh, I've got a little generator next door. And so with a laptop and a mobile phone and a petrol generator, that's when I find that I, I do my homework, freedom of information documents. You'll see it all. It's all in my in yeah. the evidence there. And that's where I get the FOI involved. I get all these people. My mate, Mark, the advocate, he's helping me to ask the right questions to get the right answers. Um, and you got, you did get, you, so you, sorry to interrupt. You, you, with all this emotional turmoil and anger you're feeling, um, you know, at least you channeled that into this drive to get to the bottom of your case. You also had some good advice um, from people that you knew, I think, I believe you also reached out to Denise Braley from the Banking and Finance Consumer Support Association. She gave you good advice. Um, what, you want to comment on some of the best advice you got, Wayne? Well, some of the advice, I'll tell you, Denise Braley knows it all. Yeah, all she's right? on to it. At, at the end of the day, and I mean, 
I found in Denise Braley the frustration I had in myself. Yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah. You know, and and Denise, she she doesn't mince her words. And neither did Wayne at some stage, and neither did I. Um, <laughs> and I was trying to understand, but I can see now that the amount of problems that Denise was going through and the amount of people she was dealing through was and not believing her as well. And, 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 and like, she's a one-off show and I'm thinking we've got AFTRA and ASIC and, a and all these different departments. He's poor Denise Braley handling all these bank victims. Yeah. But I got some good information off her. I got some facts off her. Um, I sent her some information that I had and she wrote back the terminology of what it means to have that in your document that yes, it doesn't stand in court, but this is what the banks do, all these different things. Yeah. And so I got, like I said, when I was in this shed, I wasn't a good person to be around. And that's why I left my family to do this because this is my last ditch effort to get this over the line. And if I didn't, I don't know where I'd have been. And I wasn't certainly going to be around my family when that time came. So I was pretty peed, but I went to, Denise Braley was a very big help, I must say, and, and I take my hat off to her for what she's done. And, I, and I, another piece of advice you got, and this is one of those quirky ones that um, I just want to raise it because I, I found it fascinating because it worked. Someone gave you advice of, of the best time to, to lodge a freedom of information request. Uh, yeah, there's a couple of things I learned over the time of doing this. It's about timing, Robbie. Yeah, yeah. And then the timing is very important. After speaking with Denise Braley, I noticed there was um, a lot of loan application forms not around or when people went back to look for them, they weren't there or they didn't yeah. have one. Or, and, and I was looking for mine. I said, I would like to see my loan application form. And of course, I was sent letters oh, off and all these paperwork came to me, but it was not, wasn't actually the LAF, the loan yeah. application form. So I punched it hard to get, where is the loan application form for my loan? Of course, they didn't have one. Yeah. Well, I did. They yeah. didn't want anyone to see that, I think. Yeah. So what I'd done is I got my Freedom of Information Officer on board and, I, and he pushed over and over and it was actually exhausting him because they were only sending him relevant, sending us certain amounts of documents, but it didn't have the original loan application in it, didn't have the very original documents that were yeah. in with the broker and all that was missing. And so what I did is I'd found a person who said to me, why don't you ring the bank at Christmas time? And I said, well, why would I do that? What's that going to do? A lot of staff go on holidays at Christmas, Wayne. Oh, okay. So I thought, all right. So I asked again, I sent into the same person who took my home, mind you, I'd like to have my loan application form. I requested my loan application form. And of course, I got an automatic reply saying that this person was unattending the office how, being due to holidays, the Christmas holidays, and these two new people would be sitting, taking her position whilst she was away. So hence, once I found their name, I wrote to them and said, hi, my name's blah, blah, blah. I've been dealing with this other person. They're on holidays. I'm trying to find my loan application form for this particular year. I get a letter back from that banker saying, thank you for your letter, Mr. Ditchburn. We advise we do not hold a loan application form for your loan or your loan restructure. So how do you have a loan then? <laughs> well, that's, even the bankers can't tell us that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's a funny. That's a funny thing, Robbie. But look, at the end of the day, so you only got that information because the the main person you were dealing with was on holidays, and you were able to get it from someone who wasn't their normal job. It's an innocent little person. Just someone who was honest, doing their honest job. They looked at my letter, went away to look for the loan application form. They went through it, obviously said, oh, there is none, and wrote to me and said, we don't have a loan. We, don't, we do not hold a loan application form for your loan, Ruth Drucker. Now, Wayne, one of the things you discovered through Freedom of Information is that you also were no longer a consumer. Well, apparently, um, and this is kind of where I get real cranky, Bobby, real, real angry. I'm not the smartest tool in the shed. 
but I don't care who you are. If a person would, if you put a piece of paper in front of them and said, by signing this document, you waive your consumer rights, any human being would question that. But I didn't see it. Yeah. But then when I come in my freedom of information documents, here it is in there. And the signature, well, it's a bit sketchy. Right. But apparently it's mine. And um, I then ring up to find out, well, how the, how are you, how can you not be a consumer? If, yeah. you, if you see what I mean. So yeah. I write to ASIC, I go to my member of parliament, and my member of parliament answered Marlis, and I asked her to ask these questions to ASIC. When do you become a non-consumer? Or what's the terminology on a person who's a non-consumer? Yeah. What is that? Well, ASIC can't answer it, can they? So they yeah. write back to, to my member of parliament. We can't answer these, or, you know, basically to tell me to go and get my own legal advice. This is ASIC. Yeah. Saying to my member of parliament, you know, we're not going to do anything. Yeah tell your client to basically go and get his own lawyers involved or whatever, legal advice. Um, you know that, well, I know this, um, you can have documents appraised by a QC with merit and you still can't take a bank to court, Robbie. All right? No matter how much money you got, they'll, they'll settle at the door or do something. You won't get it into a hearing. And now you asked me at that time when I had a merit in, in there and I said, well, all right, well, I want to proceed. How do we go about it? Then I find the bank wants me to put $50,000 into a trust account for me to see the case through. Yep. Now I say to the solicitor, why didn't you tell me this before I pay you all this money to have an appraisal? Yep. It's part of this. That's the impossibility of what bank victims in Australia go through. They cannot, they're bank victims, so by definition they've been ripped off and they've got no money. But to get justice, you have to put up a lot of money up front through these in these legal trust accounts, etc., and it's impossible. And as you said, and those who can who somehow can burst through all that, and have such a strong case that that the bank um, might lose in court, the bank will meet them at the steps of the court and pay them off then, so it doesn't go into court. And there's no court cases that can back up the case. Bank victims. And 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 so the problem there, Robbie, is if you don't look, how can you fix? Yeah. Well, can we go back to your chronology, guys? Because I think we're now at the probably the single most amazing bit. Thanks, to, and and I I think this is a testimony to your perseverance, Wayne. But with all this work you're doing in the shed and find you 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 eventually track down that one bank portfolio manager who had helped you out. So this is quite a few years later, and you track her down. Just to, just describe, tell the viewer that story. Okay, so this is the banker that stopped the sheriff when they were working for the bank that I was going to talk to on the Monday that doesn't yes. all of a sudden disappears from the bank. Suddenly she's, she's not, not working, working there anymore. anymore. Yeah. No. And I've got this new person and a couple of new people involved and they just uh, hardball on me, which yeah. I love to meet her. Invokes the sheriff and all these sort of things. I find her working outside of the bank, not in financial institutions or anything, in a yeah. different, complete different job now. Nothing to do with finance. And so what I do is I contact her by the phone and I and, and she remembers me because I say who I am. Yeah. Eventually she was quite taken back that I'd mentioned the place that she was working for and who I was. Yeah. And was reluctant to talk about it, saying, look, I don't work for them anymore and, look, this is nothing to do with me and blah, blah. And I said, look, I'm not hassling you or anything. I was just ringing because you were really a nice person in the bank. You showed due diligence and duty of care and you went back and looked for me and you stopped the sheriff. I said, you know, and all of a sudden you were gone. I thought you were great. I thought you were a great banker, actually, out of all the people I've dealt with. I thought you were the only one out of a bit of compassion. However... Uh, she said to me, oh, I'm not willing to speak anything further and sort of bye-bye, you know, and so I hung up. I stewed on that phone call. I couldn't take it. From, uh, oh, weeks went by until, in the end, I was, I have bad days where I get up and I'm cranky or I might be having a nightmare from whatever happened. I wake up and I'm 100 mile an hour 
and I got on that phone. I thought that was one of those mornings. So I rang her and I, she answered the phone with a nice voice for the business she was working at. And I sort of started to say, who I, oh, hi, it's me again, kind of thing. Before I could get into anything, she said, before you say anything, Wayne, I've been informed if you ever contact me again, I'm to give you this phone number, which she did. And what phone number was that, Wayne? Well, it ends up taking me to the manager of the bank who's been in the chair for over three decades. And he's very humble. Or wants, well, me to come, wants me to come into the office and have a discussion with them. This is after taking my home, putting me through hell and my family, not like if this was me, Robbie, all those years ago, and they would have kicked my butt. I probably would have ran away and with a bleeding nose and gone, you know what? I'm not going back yeah. there again. <laughs> and I would have regrouped and got on with my life. But you know what hurt me? They touched my kids. Yeah. They hurt my partner. They destroyed my mother and father at the end. Those yeah. are the things why I'm out here now fighting, not for me. And they, and these other victims you've got and all these other people that are going to fall by the wayside. And this That's is about, about yeah. and th this is at least 10 years. This is more than 10 years later, right? That you finally oh, yeah. tracked down this woman. And, and so her reaction and the bank's reaction shows that the fact you found her meant the game was up. The banks knew you'd caught them. The bank knew you'd caught them. Well, the, the lady who was contacted... That's still denial. The lady, <laughs> the lady who was contacted, who was nice, who gave me the phone number, obviously must have rung the bank the first time I'd rung her and said, I've got this bloke ringing me. Yep. And they would have crapped themselves because she would have said, well, I'm not going down for you, you whatever. Yep. And so yep. at the end of the day, when I rang her the second time, lucky I did, Robbie. Because if I, yeah, if I yeah. didn't, nobody's gonna nobody's gonna give me her phone number and say, oh, you should ring her again. It's no. just out of my head. And all of a sudden, one morning, I go, bugger that, I'm ringing her again. And that's when I do ring her. And that's when this starts. This, oh, Mr. Ditchburn, they start calling me. They've called me all <laughs> name. <laughs> it's all of a sudden, Mr. Ditchburn now. And then we're talking ex Gracia payments. I don't know, if you know, you know about Gracia payments. When I got them on the turn, I'm asking for grace. It's coming up to Christmas. We've got nothing. We were, we were on the bones of our ass. They're in damage control, and they and I'm asking for an ex grace payment, at least something, just so we can live. Yeah. They send us a check for a thousand bucks, put it in our account, and it doesn't clear. <laughs> so I have to go down to the bank. <laughs> <laughs> bank. <laughs> you might laugh, but. You know, we're at Christmas time, we've got no money, no presents for kids. Family's got prawns and all this going on. We're, we don't know what to contribute because we've got nothing. And so we get a $1,000. We think, oh, beauty, at least we've got, you know, we're going to have at least a decent Christmas with our family and we'll pretend nothing's happening. Don't let them know. Yeah, and yeah. all of a sudden we can't cash it. They won't clear the money. The bank's own check didn't clear. Uh, no, and oh, so I go to the bank, which is a different bank bank that they yeah. put it in, yeah. and I know them in the bank, and I go down and they say, look, and so they do, I ring the bloke who's doing the deal in the major bank for me and say, how, what, you send me the money now, we can't clear it, and then he's running on his end trying to clear it, this, this other bank's at their end trying to clear it for us because they know, they know us, and they're going, oh, my God, you know. And so anyway, we finally, at that late afternoon, doesn't it? That late afternoon, the bank decides that they're going to give us the money, the cash yeah, yeah. over the counter. Right. Um, these are small little details, Thank Robin, you. but at the end of the day, they still, it just shows the incompetence we're dealing with here. And, and, and it, it's just a complete shambles and a mess and nothing is, and when someone tries to do something right, like this poor lady who actually did try to stop the sheriff and do something, they get sacked for it. Yeah. It seems. Well, we don't know if she got sacked. So, Wayne, what were what were the negotiations with the bank? Once once the banks are calling you, once the bank's calling you, Mr. Ditchburn, what were those negotiations like? Well, before that, Robbie, you've got to remember the bank has stopped the sheriff once. Yeah. When the new girl takes over, they send the sheriff, and the sheriff turns up to evict us. Yeah. Yeah. And they got the documents wrong. 
The yeah. wrong address. The address okay. is wrong. Now, this is the bank people, <coughs> the smartest people in the world yeah. that, have made, that have made everyone jump. Yeah. Right? They've made the sheriff jump. They've made the receivers jump. They've made the real estate agents jump. They've made the valuations jump. They had the New South Wales police at my lined up in my driveway. Yeah. Pretty heavy. So these people, all these departments have turned up to evict us. Paperwork's wrong. Guess what the sheriff says? You're right, Wayne. I said, what happens now, Sheriff? He says, we're all going. And I said, what do I do? And he says, well, they'll, don't worry, they'll be coming back. But he said, don't worry, I'll be making a point of this when I get back. He said, I've just drove from Goulburn today to get here. And when I find in my freedom of information, not only him, the, the New South Wales police force turned up. Well, I didn't know this. They were down my driveway. It's in my freedom of information. Yeah. Good. Yeah. So the sheriff, two sheriffs have turned up. The police, the receiver, the real estate agents, and they all have to go home, Robbie. Because why? The bank's got everything wrong. Oh, and so dear. all these people's time. So the second time, they send the sheriff again. This time, they've changed the address. And there's nowhere for us to go. Receivers turn up, the whole bloke, they shut the door, take the lock off the door, kick us out. We've got nowhere. We're crying. Me and he's bawling our eyes out. Little Annie was four. So this is three, three times. Three the first old. lady stops the sheriff. Second lady takes over and, and puts the sheriff back on us. Wrong information. Sheriff has to come again, and that's when they evict us. Now, all these people, all these people have been made to do this at the at the yeah. of the bank. Yeah. Put everyone. Everyone's jumped for the bank. Yeah. Nobody's asked us anything. And they're wrong. The bank's in, in hindsight, the bank's wrong. You can see this in the end. And where are they here? No one's listening. No, the sheriff's doing his job because he just has to. The receiver's been told they've got to do it, so they have to. The police have, have to. Yeah. And these are all victimising us, and we did nothing wrong. We, we've been fisting the bank for money, which we shouldn't be paying, and they're still doing this to us. Yeah. And even the locksmith, when he left, he said, I don't know... Um, I'm leaving this up to you to shut the door. And that was to me because Wayne was in Aladala. Oh, no. Wayne is on. I can't, it's full on anyway. I can't remember much. But, yeah, it was just, it was. He was worried. The real estate guy. Because I not, knew. Not the guy that sold our house, mind you. Another guy, another real estate guy. And when he came, he sort of looked at me and he went, Wayne. And I said, oh, mate, yeah, here you go. Because I knew him. Well, I stayed there for another two weeks. He was shocked after and please. saddened that he was locking out us out of our house because he he know he sort of knew me and he knew that. Like this wasn't. The oh, only... oh, oh, I'm not lying. He kind of had that impression, I guess. He didn't want to leave any in outside the house. This this illustrates this illustrates another issue with banking in Australia, which is that. The, the, the bad decision-making you're dealing with is happening in head office, right? It's not happening locally. It's not your local branch manager that's doing this to you. It's people, un, un, yeah, yeah. Fa office, faceless yeah. names in head office doing this to you. So if we can just get back to the chronology, you, you've now got that number and you've, you've, you've got a, a, a manager calling you Mr. Ditchburn eventually. Um, so... You get to meet one of those faceless names. So what, 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 what was that process like? And, and he, he said something very interesting to you, Wayne. Just recount to the audience what that was because this was about two years before the Royal Commission, I believe, roughly, 2016, if, if I got that right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm in, the, I'm in this shed, so you can imagine my... Every time I see bank corruption on the, reported on Google I, and it's got to do with that particular bank, Yep. I send him an email to that person who took my home saying, just keeping you up to date. <laughs> Good. All right. So I do this, I do this for years, Robbie, years. Yeah. Well, it exhausts them. And they ring me and abuse me. And then they send their solicitors sending me. This is after they've taken my home. Then they write it, they and she gets her off. They get their solicitor on their side to write to me to say cease and desist because they've already taken my home and that's done and it's bad luck for me, cease and desist. 
contacting the bank with your email saying keeping you up to date and i said well no i'm still a customer of your bank because yeah. here's all my statements occurring interest on the shortfall of the home you sold that now you haven't sent me a statement but you're compiling under the freedom of information act i got those statements which said i owed them over hundred thousand dollars or something in interest that was occurring in my name without them notifying me when I contacted their solicitor to say, well, that's nice of you to say cease and desist, but I'd like to now ask your advice on what I do as a customer of your bank, considering you're charging me interest to a shortfall on my foreclosed home that you haven't sent me any bank statements to. Well, <laughs> of course, the solicitor must have got back to the banker and said, what the bloody hell are you doing to us? Yeah, yeah. Because they've seen... They're sending me a letter saying that it's done, but they've yeah. still got interest occurring on my name. Yeah. <laughs> it's not done. You see? Then yeah, there's the end, after settlement, of, which is why I, I mean, it pops around in my head everywhere, but I, after the settlement with these guys, then I start getting all these debt collecting agencies chasing me for credit card debt that the bank sold them. Oh no! That well, let's I, okay. The better let, let's let let's register that. That that's fascinating. I want I want I want you to describe the settlement process though before we before you um, so people understand how significant that detail is. So you've got this guy talking to you now, and and it, there's there's going to be some kind of a settlement. But how, what's the attitude of the bank in trying to settle with you? First settlement, we go into the room and because I'd been writing them all these letters of corruption and that, that they're in their bank, when I get into the bank, <coughs> I said to he he, they tried to have a little offer, a small amount. They brought a bloke over from Western Australia to sit in the meeting too. He was new to the system. And I took my first solicitor with me um, and we sat together and they could, they were doing all the talking and started to tell me all this sort of stuff. And in the end of the day, it came up and it was just that I said, oh, this is systemic corruption here. Yeah. Well, the bank manager said to me on the way out the door after the meeting, quietly pulls me aside and says to me, oh, look, Wayne, I wanted to let you know about the emails that you'd been sending. And uh, I just wanted to reassure you that it, it's not systemic. <laughs> And I told him, I said, well, unfortunately, mate, the people I have met now and yeah. the people that I've dealt with and the social media people that I know that are suffering and the ones that I've talked to that were about to commit suicide shows me that it is systemic. Oh, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, it's such a Freudian slip from this banker because it's two years before the Royal Commission, you've got a top manager at the bank telling you, because yeah, they're essentially acknowledging wrongdoing in your case, maybe not in by their words, but by their actions. So that's why you're t discussing settlement. And But he has to go out of his way to try and tell you it's not systemic, whereas two years later, if there was any doubt, it was absolutely proven by the Royal Commission that there was. Um, that's the first meeting, Robbie. Yeah. Where they lowball. And my solicitor who's next to me says, well, before when they start to come up with what they're going to do for this solution, the solicitor says, well, do you mind holding on and letting Mr. Ditchburn tell his story? And that's where I say, now I'm going to take you back to 2004, where I went into a broker's office and I borrowed money for a first home, first home with a first home buyer's grant. And you, the manager, of this particular bank were in the chair at that time, you know. Yeah. So you, the guy who came from Western Australia, by the time I'd finished my story and told him what I come had found and how the whole system has worked, he was back in his chair like that. He closed <laughs> his laptop down there like that. And he looked at the banker who was very red faced and said, well, we're not, we won't be settling this today. He flew wow. back to Western Australia and a second meeting was generated then. And that banker who was there for 30 odd years or whatever, wasn't in the meeting anymore. He was sacked or gone. Well, I know he was, I don't know if he was sacked, but I know he definitely was gone. 
because so, here he, he turns up later on at a different institution, which I find. So essentially, though, Wayne, the, the, the reaction of the banker from Western Australia was that, OK, this is a far more serious problem than I've been led to believe. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, so you did. You ended up getting a settlement, but in the, sec in the second meeting, I take another gentleman with me who's also a barrister, and I ask my solicitor, "Does he mind if I bring this?" Because this is another fellow who's been into banking systems and stuff, and has, has an idea of you know, and what was looking at doing a royal uh, class action and things in the past. And I'd been talking with this fella over the time, not as a pointed person, but just as a community yeah. person, nice. social media person. And then I took him and my original solicitor, so John and Chris came with me, me and Eni together, went and into Mark. the next meeting and a, my advocate friend, Mark. And in that meeting, before we go in that meeting, my legal team asked, are you able to fulfill this claim today? Do you have the power? They say, yeah, and when we go in, it's a bartering match. And I, I just can't believe it. I haven't asked for any more money for all the damage of my health or anything. Yeah. I'm hoping to get enough to get me home, to get me kids back on their feet again and have some kind of life after it. Not and, even enough to buy a house. And go. so I realised then these guys are still lowballing me after everything they've done to us, every yeah. single thing that they've done to my family. Not only that, in every single meeting, I've brought my bag of documents with me and I wanted to pull them out onto the table to show them where they went wrong and what. And every time they didn't want to see them. We know, we know Wayne, we don't actually want to go back there. Yeah. And that's why I say to you this, if we don't look or view a case of anyone in Australia against banking, how are we going to know where the pitfalls or the palings are missing out of the deck? Sure, sure. Through those holes, and fall to the floor. And and in the, unless they're going to have the stamina like I did to ring them every day and, and, and bark them down and, and, and do what they did to me by hassling me every day and ruining my life, I had nothing else to live for except ringing them every day. This is my new job. I, I, now, I am now the bank hassler, you yeah. know, and, and I don't want to be that. I just want to get on with my life. Yeah. But I have to keep doing this because... I've, I'm, that's all I'm left with. I'm left with nothing but this string of, of bankers and I've just, my family's going by the wayside and I've, I'm going downhill. So I have to keep going. At this. So Wayne, you had a figure in mind that, that was predicated on things like what you had to pay back all those people you'd borrowed money from just to keep surviving, etc. And it was a certain figure for a bank like this, a big bank like this, it was completely. It, it was. It was. A, it, it would have been nothing to them to actually pay you that figure or more that you owed. You ended up getting about what two thirds of that. Some in terms of a settlement that you finally felt you had to take. But how did your legal advisors describe that? I wrought. Yeah. Basically, they said it was unfair, which all bank payment. You know, they are. They're not. They're not fair. Um, and it was a kind of situation where I'd got to. It's a take it, take this way or there's nothing. Yeah. And by that um, point, by that point, you needed to actually take it. And so you did. And you got to think this is 16 you know, years of you, fighting. The reason yeah. I took it is, uh, and, and, and it's, it's because I was advised there was nothing else. And my barristers had said to me, you know, look, at the end yeah. of the day, Wayne, it's unfair and whatever. But um, we'll, we'll, they were looking at me, my health. They were looking at my partner and the condition. They're looking at the kids. They were thinking of that as well. Uh, in the end, they talked me. I said, if I was here on my own and these kids weren't here, and I said, there's no way in the world I'll be settling this today. Yeah. But I said, I have to because of my kids. So I was stuck. I was kind of jammed in a corner, whereas if I didn't sign it, my family still suffered more. Yeah. You get it? So it wasn't, it wasn't the all. It but wasn't Wayne's, it wasn't really his choice. Yeah. It was mine, knowing what Wayne had been through already, like, yeah. like yeah. let's stop this. But, it, but I mean, it's started and stopped. I'm ready to fight more now than I ever have. Well, of course, now. sorry, Rowena, just less than a year after you, this settlement, the Royal Commission's underway. And did that, did that fire you up again, Wayne, when you saw the actual proof? We were so excited. Of course, it fired me up. 
no wonder these guys wanted to settle before the bank royal commission. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean, Robbie? Yeah, yeah. And not only that, let's talk about the bank royal commission. Why wasn't a case like mine when I put my, I put my submissions yeah. in? Why wasn't that looked at? Too many yeah. people would have gotten trouble. That's it's why. a cracker case. I mean, it's got everything. It's got all the bells and whistles you want for yep. a commissioner Hain to have a good trunk out, you know. Yep. They don't want to see these cases, Robbie. They, they should have. That, that Royal Commission, the, the terms of reference were so low that no people like me would have got in. How many? 50 out of 10,000 or whatever. Yep. But then the recommendations after the Bank and Royal Commission have been squandered, like, you know, Let's yes. not worry about them. We've got COVID now. Well, that's going to be the cover-up. And at the end now, we've got Josh Freudenberg last week coming out saying, hey, bankers, go back to your old ways. Yeah. How, can, how can I sit out here and, and watch television and watch these people get on television and tell us what we're expected to do and how we want trust in it? Like, look at the parliament for a start with the, the rape and the bullying of women. And I go to my member of parliament, answered Marlis, who's a Liberal member, who's a lovely lady, who says to us in there, wow, absolutely wow. And, and in the end, I said, look, I hope this doesn't hurt. She said, I'm here to fight for you. You're my constituents. You've come with me and brought these documents. I've got to take. Then she wrote, writes to her secretary to line me up a meeting with the then right. treasurer, Scott Morrison, to discuss this fraud in her words. Yeah. And what happens, Robbie? Where does answered Marlis end up? Out of Parliament. Some? Yeah. Gone. And where do I, what happens to me? Anini. Hello, we went to yeah. you and brought our stuff and, yeah. oh, 26 times Scott Morrison votes down and next thing he ends up being our Prime Minister. And today, we've got these people as first, Sterling first, Surely the bank's got enough money to help these people live the last 10 or 15 years of their life? Of course. Hey, um, Wayne, um, I have to apologise because we're never going to truly do justice to a story like this, but I do believe that the viewer will have a great insight because you and, and you, Rowena, have been wonderful to talk to and I think you've told the story really well. We are running out of time, though. I just want to get your comments on a couple of quick things, right, before we wrap this up. Um, what was your experience with ASIC, the, 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 the so-called tough cop on the beat? Describe that part of it. Ridiculous. Oh, it's a nightmare. <laughs> Look, you don't even bother going to ASIC or FOS or the new AFCA because I'll tell you why, Robbie. After the settlement of the bank, I was still dissatisfied after the walking me. I wrote back to the bank. I wrote to the CEO of the bank who, who was yeah. happy to take my email and I explained to him what I thought. And he wrote back, fair call, you know, I, and, and then they want to send more bankers fly to my not-so-good house anymore to see what else I've got after the Bank Royal Commission. We're living in a shed at this point. And so... <laughs> like a shearing shed. I'm just watching my world of Australia have these laws that don't really help anybody. Um, and you've got to do all this stupid unorthodox methods to try and get some kind of justice, you see, which I did. I'm probably getting off the track a little bit, but look, after the Bank Royal Commission, see this here. I won't show you the names in this, but I just wanted to show you this. That looks pretty thick. Well, can you see all these yellow oh, well. stickers on here, Robbie? Yep, yep. Sign, sign here, sign. This is approved for friends of ours that asked me would I look at it after. This is after they knew what happened to us. They're buying a property like ours. Yeah. Just me, would you please just have a look at it? And I said, look, I'm, I'm no one special. I could have a look at it and not, you know, if I see something that I don't think is good, I'll tell you. So I, I, I just go see it. That it's already pre, pre prepared and signed, signed, just sign, and you've got the money. Yep. And it's not good, Robbie. No. Would you, I, I could challenge you now. I'll give you any of you, all your solicitors and barristers, all that. And you come back to me after you've read that, however long it's going to take you, and, and you tell me what's in that. You tell me if you understand that. Now, this is a first home buyer, yeah. a person who's going to buy a home. So I, I stopped them and I asked them, would they mind if I took them to a person that I know to have a look at getting a loan for them? And they were happy with that. I took them back to the original bank manager 
who was involved in my problem in 2004 that doesn't work for this bank anymore, works for someone else. Yeah. But I trust that man because he's a human being and he's got a good heart. And I also, when my settlement came, I also opened an account up with that banker, that yeah. uh, manager, and I put my money that the the Other set bank. the settlement was for. I put it into that bank that he is in control of still today, because I trusted him and the broker. I trust. I don't trust anybody else there. These kids came to me with this and asked me would I help them, and I did help them, and I took them to my original bank manager. And today they are kicking goals. They have got a twelve-page roughly document for their loan under yeah. consumer code. They bought a thousand-acre property and they're happy. Okay, and they're really, really good workers. They're good little fellows. They go hard. They're family orientated, and that's why I stuck my neck on the line to help them because I thought I cannot stand to see another family go down the tubes with documents like this. So they're they're doing well today instead of being trapped in whatever's buried in those documents there. Yeah, yeah. Well, thick. We do have their permission to talk about that. But this is the. Names. Oh, and I want to while you while we're discussing this, this is the floor of caveat emptor because caveat emptor is the Latin meaning "Let the buyer beware." that you're responsible for the your mess you get yourself in. That's what Scott Morrison says. That's how our financial system runs. But that implies, what you've just held up implies that every normal person, consumer, walks around with a Pitt Street lawyer in their pocket, being able to double check everything that they ever do. And that's not how the real world works. But the banks and the financial predators take advantage of that. They know if they present documents to people with all these yellow stickers here, sign here, it's sign here. So many people, it's just human nature will do that and they're preying on that. They're, that's their business model. This is not something, and, and then they turn around and go, oh, it was your fault. No, no, no. And, and if, if, and if Wayne got blamed so much, like yeah. we, even friend, we lost a lot of friends through this as well. Just different comments, I'll oh, just pay your mortgage, just do this, do that, you know, and we were working our butts off to get to where we were. Sure. And then well, you know, one person specifically, just after it all happened, looked at me and said, oh, you were telling the truth. After 15 years, I could have yeah, slammed yeah, yeah. so hard. Mm -hmm. Why would you like it? Oh, uh, Rowena, I, I can imagine. I want to mention what, just, just quickly, back to um, ASIC, you shared with me a letter that they wrote to you where, by their own, in 2019, but in their own letter, they list all the, t t the it's a letter informing you why they don't think they, they need to look at your case anymore. And they list all the dates in which they have already looked at your case. And three of those dates were from before the bank itself effectively acknowledged wrongdoing by the settlement. And so in black and white, ASIC is acknowledging that it paid no attention to real wrongdoing in yeah, your yeah. case. Right, and it's just washed its hands of it. And this is this is one of the reasons we need to overhaul ASIC, um, guys. Probably got, Robbie, that's probably just one email that I've got. Oh, I know, I know. Well, you you shared enough with me. I I know what you've got there. It's it's uh, I I, have, I know a fraction of what you got there. It's but it's incredible. Let's wrap this up because we do want to um, keep it in a manageable time that people want to watch it. I hope people watch every second of this. And please, please, viewers, share this widely. That the, the country needs to to, to know this story. Um, but in in conclusion, Wayne Rowena, um, with everything you've been through and everything you know now, etc., what do you want Australians? What do you want Australian politicians to know? Well, I'll put it this way: from, I'm not from me, <laughs> from me, I know. All right. I've experienced it. I went through it. I walked through it. I ran through it. I got smacked in it. I'm up. I've had it, everything you can imagine put up against me. But what I'm seeing, as I've seen, legislation change to protect it. I've seen things come up against me, like Anne St. Marlis, where I took my documents to, where I thought was a beautiful woman, and she was. Don't get me wrong. I mean, Liberal Labor. I don't care. I'm not. I'm not interested in what you do. Yeah. When I see you as a person and I meet you and I met her, I knew she was up against it. She had tears in her eyes. But I could see stars. I could see her her humanity coming through because she couldn't help. We're in front of her and we're telling yeah. her and we're showing her the documents. She can't deny it. And so she does a damnedest to try and go back to politics to say, writes a letter, copies me in on it, trying to get me a meeting with Scott Morrison and then treasure to discuss it. Look. 
it doesn't go any the terms of reference the royal commission the recommendations not implemented we've got like my mother and father australian capital reserve all those years ago still getting ripped off how long does this keep going for before yeah. someone opens a big door on it and looks at it fully and has yeah. a full investigation looks at the legislated like at the end of the day when i started this i had tony abbott and we finished with we ended up with Tony Abbott, then we ended up with Turnbull, Turnbull, and then we ended up with Scott Morrison. And amongst them all, we've got, we had the Kelly O'Dwyers and all these different people that I tried to write to, that, but they're all financial people and they all worked at banks. Yeah. And my point is that I'd, write to, I'd rather see a plumber or a concrete or a bricklayer be the prime minister. You know, someone who's done their time on the land, but they might have bunged their leg up or broken their arm or something, or they've got a crook back, but they can sit in a chair and they've got a good head. Um, I'd like those people to be in power. Well, actually, you know, Wayne, no, no, good point, because the last, the last prime minister of Australia to truly take on the banks was a train engine driver named Ben Chifley in, in 1949. And... None, none, of the, none, none of the lawyers or economists that have come since then have, 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 have bothered to do anything. Um, here's what I want Australian people to know from this case. Yep, yep. You're, as I told you on the phone, as I said in the article, I really take my hat off to you guys because your persistence is so extraordinary. Your stamina is so extraordinary. You just didn't back off and you broke through in an, in a, in an unsatisfactory way, but nevertheless, you broke through. And you're, you're the exception, I, I believe you're the exception that proves the rule when it comes to bank victims. Bank victims cannot all do what you've done. Little, the little grandmas who are victims of Sterling First in Western Australia cannot be expected to do what you've done. We need a better system that can make sure the bank victims get justice. However, you're an example for, for us Australians politically that if we want a proper financial system, we can't, have any, we can't say, oh, well, we had a Royal Commission and nothing came out of it, so why bother? No, no, no. You don't back off. You persist and you persist and you persist until you get it. And that's what we're going to do. And that's why I wanted you guys on this show, right? Because you're, you're great Australians. You're, you're an example to us all. Um, um, and I appreciate that you reached out. I have to give you one. I have to say this, Robbie, once more, right? After the settlement, after Bank Royal Commission, I ring the bank. After they come out to my property here to have a look at it, I get a little bit lost. But at the end of the day, they suggest to me, if I'm still not satisfied, which I just had a member of parliament write to me two days ago, if I'm not satisfied, Wayne, I need to um, raise a historical complaint with the company called AFCA. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Now, the bank suggests that I go to AFCA after settlement if I'm still not happy. The m members of politicians have told me to go there. And so everyone's told me to go to the new AFCA. Now, I just want to explain something to you, Robbie, about AFCA. Yeah. Two bankers, oh, sorry, the banker originally in, involved in the foreclosure and wrong foreclosure of my... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the FOS officer... Who ignored your complaint. The bank, they, they trash us and take yeah. our home. And after all these years passed, they asked us to go back to AFCA. Guess yeah. who we find working there, Robbie? The bank the original officer. The banker who was in oh. the construction of my home and the original FOS officer who was on the bank side that wrongly took our home the first time. Now, I want to ask the politicians this. How is our family expected to go to a new department that you've set up after yeah. you score 26 times to not have a bank royal commission, then set all this bank royal commission up low ball so we couldn't really see the truth. And now we've got an AFCA that you expect people like us to take our historical case to, to have the same people look at and make yeah. a decision favouring us? Yeah. I can't see it. No, I, I agree. That's a, great, that's a great illustration of the problem. Um, and But like I said, we, you don't... Don't take a cynical view of this and say, I'll oh, see you'll never change it. No, no, be inspired by what Wayne or Rowena have done and let's make sure we change it. Um, in conclusion, I just want to highlight that um, uh, as we discussed, Wayne reached out to me after reading our stuff on Sterling First. So right now we're having this discussion as we're in the middle of a campaign to use the Sterling First scandal in Western Australia to get an inquiry 
in the center into sterling first and ASIC. Now we're going to be pushing hard on this point because we do need to, I'll, I'll, I'll give you one practical reason why a Senate inquiry into ASIC is good. If the Senate decides to conduct an inquiry into ASIC and use cases like Sterling First and other bank victims' cases, they get to write their own terms of reference. And the, the, the well-motivated senators can make sure they're strong terms of reference. Whereas when we force the government to conduct the Royal Commission, as you referred to, Wayne, they, um, they wrote their own terms of reference to, to, write, to make sure there was only so much that it could do. So this is a very important campaign to make sure we get that inquiry. And if we get that inquiry, viewers, they can have hearings where people like Wayne can be called to tell his story. There's, there is, there are, we haven't been able to name the bank and the people involved in this, in this um, conversation because there's limits, legal limits on what Wayne can say. But in front of an inquiry in the Senate, there are no legal limits. He can lay it all out and tell the senators directly that, in, that story and make sure we do not back off on this question until we have reformed the financial system. And then one final plug for where the Citizens Party is coming from. <clears throat> a big chunk of reforming the financial system is not just improving regulation in Australia. It's breaking the power of the big four banks' monopoly. Because that power gives them power over the economy and it gives them power over politics. And, a, and the most effective way to break that power is to get a bank started, a public bank, and we propose one through the post offices and the, the Commonwealth Postal Savings Bank that will attract customers because your, your deposits will be guaranteed. It'll have to provide services. It'll operate through the post office. It's owned by the government. The banks will not be able to crush it because it's owned by the government. And, and suddenly you'll be able to break their monopoly. And if you break their monopoly, you can break their power. And that will also contribute immensely to a proper, um, properly functioning financial system. So that's, that's, that's the, the overarching motivation there. So Wayne and Rowena, let's, let's um, end this. Uh, one, one more thing, Robbie, we need. Right. Accountability. That's it. That's right. it. There isn't any accountability. None of these people have to worry about ever being fined or go to jail or anything. So when you haven't got any accountability, I can't see others coming through that are going to do the right thing if there's no accountability. Of course. There was a, the, the, at the very time ASIC was ignoring your case, it's, it was chaired by a gentleman named Greg Medcraft who in 2014 admitted Australia is a paradise for white collar criminals. That's what he said. And why is it a paradise for white collar criminals, Wayne? Because none of them ever go to jail. Right? There is, there is no accountability. And there, everyone's aware of this, but we need to persist with the case. We can, like I said, let's not t adopt the attitude, oh, we had a Royal Commission that shows there's nothing we can do. No, no, we have to do it. And we're, we're, we are making headway, but we have to build the case again. And for that reason, I'm immensely grateful you guys have come on the, on the uh, Citizens Insight today. So thank you very much. Thank you for listening, Don. Th thanks very much, Robbie. And I'd like to give you a plug. Yep. Out of all the people I've been to over the last... 18 odd years, you guys, Denise Braley and people like that actually know. You, you've said stuff that relates to me that I know that you guys know. I've seen Wayne okay? so relieved at the things that and you when said I, to him and he's just like, oh my God, someone knows what I'm saying. When I've seen you with the bank bail-ins and then I've seen you with the Australian Post fiasco, I knew that you guys have the and you have this you know what i'm talking about and when i a person like me comes to you i feel so much um at ease talking to you guys because i know you know that what i'm saying to you has happened to others you've heard it before from others but you also have a full handle on it and you know exactly what to do and i really really hope the australian people all get behind your party because I didn't even know your party had been going for such a long time until I started doing this thing. But I do see what you have in your logo is the Citizens Party, and I do see you are for the citizens, and I thank you very much for that. All right, thanks, guys. That's, that's very nice of you to say. We, we try very hard, and we want to clean up the system. So I think we've, um, we've got a meeting of minds here. But we better call an end to this conversation or else YouTube will run out of space. <laughs> All right, thanks for joining us. And thanks to the viewer. If, um, please like and share this show widely. Um, this is something that, although it's slightly long, uh, it's, it's a gripping story. Get it around to everybody. Get it to politicians. Let's get this ASIC inquiry up. Yep. All right.
Thanks for tuning in. Thank you. Thank you.